three jailhouse snitches who came forward, two of them just days before the trial, testified about conversations they had with McCullough at the DeKalb County Jail. They all said he admitted killing Maria, but each gave a slightly different account of the killing and all said Maria died by strangling or suffocation. They didn't name the cause of death determined by a forensic anthropologist, stabbing. Jailhouse snitches are notoriously unreliable. They are criminals, or at least accused of crimes, so their credibility is suspect. Most inmates who offer testimony are looking to cut a deal for themselves by hanging someone else out to dry. Kirk Swaggerty, Christopher Diaz, and a third inmate who testified under the pseudonym John Doe had been locked up with McCullough on cell block G. Swaggerty, was the first to provide information. He wrote a letter to the state's attorney's office. His motive, he said, was to do the right thing. But he'd been convicted of a home invasion murder, and he also was asking the court for a reduction in his 33-year sentence. He said he'd been promised nothing. Whether he expected something was another issue. McCullough admitted he had killed Rodolph, Swaggerty testified, but claimed it was an accident. He explained that Maria fell during the piggyback ride. She wouldn't stop screaming and he was trying to keep her quiet and she suffocated. He also heard a story McCullough volunteered during his police interrogation and later in his interview with CNN. He said that he had called the FBI himself because he had a dream that a guy named Johnny did this to the girl and that the guy Johnny lived a few houses away from the little girl. But if Swaggerty is to be believed, McCullough took that story a step further. He then told me he was Johnny. The other two inmates shared a cell. They said they came forward when McCullough told them he was looking for someone to kill Swaggerty because he was a snitch. Diaz was in custody on an immigration hold after being accused of having sex with a 14-year-old girl. He testified that he turned down the volume on his headphones as McCullough walked into his cell and started talking about his case. He was saying about how he was giving the little girl, the victim, a piggyback ride and he, he ran with her down this alley once the other girl that was there went inside the house to grab the mittens. McCullough returned the next day and talked some more. That time, Diaz testified, he said he strangled the little girl with a wire. Doe, another convicted home invasion killer, testified that McCullough told him he slipped while giving the child a piggyback ride. The little girl hit her head and started crying or yelling. He said it was an accident. Then McCullough said he carried the child inside his house and choked her. Doe testified. Later, he said, McCullough changed his story, saying he strangled her with a wire. Doe also picked up on McCullough's odd demeanor when he spoke of Maria, just as investigators had. He would seem almost childlike. He would get real giddy, if that's the right word. It's like he couldn't stop himself. He would just keep going and going. When he was talking about the little girl, he would get amped up. Testimony lasted all of four days. McCullough did not take the stand, so his alibi was never presented. Besides the excluded FBI reports, there were other missing pieces at the trial. The unused train ticket from Rockford to Chicago didn't come into evidence, nor did the video of his eight-hour police interrogation. That evidence didn't really prove anything, other than to cast doubt on his credibility, and by remaining silent, he didn't call his credibility into question. When it came time for the verdict, Judge Halleck said he believed the informants and found Kathy Chapman's testimony particularly convincing. He didn't say a word about what Eileen Tessier told her daughters on her deathbed. A loud cheer erupted as the judge handed down the verdict, guilty on all counts, murder, kidnapping, and abduction of an infant. Johnny was going to prison, 
Kathy was finally free. If I would have been shown his picture in 1957, she said, he would not have been a free man all those years. He would have been in jail. Vada News Conference, Janet Tessier told Maria's siblings she was sorry. Sorry that her brother killed Maria, and sorry it had taken so long for the truth to be told. She apologized on behalf of her mother. Jaded cops had tears in their eyes. Justice was Maria's at last. McAuliffe is 73, and prison life isn't easy. He spends most of his time alone. He is kept in protective custody because he qualifies twice as the lowest form of life in prison culture. He's a convicted child killer and an ex-cop. He spoke for several hours with CNN while at the state's maximum security prison in Menard before being moved to another prison in Pontiac, most likely because of his age and notoriety. Menard, a 19th century brick behemoth, overlooks the Mississippi River in southern Illinois, about an hour's drive from St. Louis, Missouri. McCulloch announced his innocence without prompting as he sat down and was shackled to a metal table. I've been accused and convicted of a murder I did not commit, he said it twice. He seemed happy to have visitors. He likes to talk, especially about himself. He broke into tears when asked about his combat experience in Vietnam, but showed little emotion as he spoke about the murder in his hometown. His explanation, I was part of one, but not the other. He tried to steer the conversation away from questions about Jean, the sister who accused him of rape, and his acquittal in that case. We have a history, he said of his sister. He used the same expression to describe the relationship between his mother and her father, who he believes sexually abused her. He spoke about his mother as if she were a saint and called Janet, the sister who launched the murder investigation, a black sheep and a liar. He responded with a non sequitur when asked, if he were innocent, why would so many people tell lies about him in court? Exactly. He wouldn't discuss the nude photograph of his 12-year-old daughter that an ex-wife said she found hidden under a drawer. He said his daughter was troubled and had problems with men, drugs, and alcohol. He said he regretted taking in the teen runaway Michelle Weinman when he was a police officer and says she set me up. I was accused of rape, and it didn't happen. By the time of CNN's interview, he had come to recognize that others found it strange that he referred to seven-year-old Maria Ridolph as lovely, lovely, lovely. He changed his wording, calling her precious. An odd expression crossed his face when he spoke of the little girl with the dark curly hair and big brown eyes. There is a gap between his front teeth, and he does have a high, thin voice, just as Kathy described all those years ago. He's quick to anger over certain subjects, and when that happens, there is nothing soft in his blue eyes. Unlike many destined to end their days behind bars, Jack McCullough has not been forgotten. His wife of nearly 20 years, Sue McCullough, and a stepdaughter, Janie O'Connor, wrote letters to the court saying they stood by him. Both are certain that he is the victim of a grave injustice. Their letters were more articulate than many written on behalf of men judged guilty of heinous crimes. Sue scolded the authorities in Illinois. My husband was convicted in order to close the oldest cold case in U.S. history. You should all be ashamed of yourselves. And the hurt in O'Connor's words was unmistakable. Perhaps sacrificing one old man is enough to give an entire community closure, she wrote. My dad is innocent. I hope the pain of my family is worth the five minutes of fame you all have received. O'Connor, 35, says she trusted McCulloch with her own daughter, and he doted on the child. When police came to arrest Jack, the little girl was watching cartoons in his bedroom. O'Connor has assumed the role of her stepfather's spokesman and champion. 
When she first met him, she says, she was a wild kid, exactly the type of teenager he has been accused of preying upon. It would have been so easy for him to cross the line with her, she said, but he never did. Instead, McCullough was patient. He became the father she never had. She believes now it is her turn to watch out for him. O'Connor does not rant. She is logical in her arguments. She doesn't understand why the court didn't let her stepfather defend himself better. She doubts how much Kathy Chapman can remember about that night long ago. It was dark, it was snowing, and Kathy was just eight. O'Connor points out that Chapman picked out another man she said resembled the kidnapper at a lineup in Wisconsin back in 1957. It turned out he couldn't have been Johnny. He had an alibi. The timeline bothers her, too. The time of the kidnapping has shifted from 7 p.m. back to about 6. It also troubles her that the defense couldn't present evidence of a collect phone call placed from Rockford to the Tessier family house at 6.57 p.m. or anything from the 1957 FBI reports that once cleared him as a suspect and she absolutely does not believe the stories told by the Tessier sisters. She wonders whether her stepfather, as the firstborn in his family, and his mother's clear favorite, wasn't targeted by the others out of some twisted sibling rivalry. There's a blog now, where the family raises questions about the evidence used to convict McCullough. His stepdaughter hopes someone will notice and take up his cause, as others have done in famous controversial cases such as the West Memphis Three. Sue McCullough also is standing by her man. She acts at times like this mess is all a big misunderstanding, and he'll come home soon. She passes the time in a rickety chair in the bedroom of their small apartment in Seattle. There isn't much furniture, just a few chairs, a bed, and a home computer. A large safe dominates the living room, her husband's Stetson hat resting on top. She has visited him in prison and says he seems frail. She treasures a letter he wrote a few months after his arrest. She had it laminated and keeps it close. Hang on because I'm going to not only apologize, I'm going to say I'm sorry. My pen didn't want to write that, but my heart did. I do need to say I'm sorry for all the times I disappointed you, made you mad, made you sad, yelled at you or just pissed you off. The letter begins. What is he apologizing for? Nothing specific, she says. He just wanted me to know he's going to treat me better when he comes home. A criminal trial is a journey to the truth, or so goes the conventional wisdom. Witnesses are sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But the whole truth is rarely told at trials. They are more like well-scripted plays, edited in advance through a series of pre-trial legal maneuvers and evidentiary rulings. The prosecution's version of the truth was told last fall at McCullough's four-day murder trial. The defense consisted of an anemic attempt to poke a few holes in the prosecution's script. Based on the judge's pre-trial rulings, it became a situation in which we sort of tried the case with our hands tied behind our back, said his lawyer, public defender Tom McCulloch. The defense attorney could not show that the FBI had cleared his client decades ago. Without putting his client on the stand, he could not present an alibi defense. He could not tell Jack McCullough's version of the truth, nor could he argue that Kathy Chapman had picked out someone else in the Wisconsin lineup back in 1957. Because she could not recall the lineup on the witness stand, he couldn't question her about it. Had the crime been committed a year or two ago, there likely would have been DNA samples to test, along with credit card receipts, phone records, and cell phone GPS pings to trace. There would have been little doubt where McCullough was and when. The key witnesses would be alive and their memories would be fresh. Judge James Halleck ruled before the trial that Eileen Tessier's dying statement implicating her son would be admitted, 
but the 1957 FBI reports would be barred. As a result, a mother was able to accuse her son from the grave, but his alibi was never heard. Would justice have been better served by a hearing of all of the facts and theories? I think the question of how you deal with old reports that are as authentic as the day is long, in the context of them being the sole remaining evidence of a defendant's alibi, is something an appellate case will have to decide, said McCulloch, the defense attorney. Halleck could not comment on his rulings. Judge Judith Broca, the chief judge of his circuit, cited McCulloch's appeal and said in an email that the state's code of judicial conduct prohibits a judge from public comment about a pending proceeding in any court. But this 55-year-old kidnapping and murder suffered from weaknesses typical of cold cases. The physical evidence that had existed was lost, including the doll Maria was carrying and her killer handled. No murder weapon was found. Most of the witnesses were dead. When it came down to our case and the state's attorney's case, said defense investigator Crystal Harrell. The state had more people alive than we did. Prosecutors and defense attorneys were left to reconstruct history with what little evidence they had. And that is why a decision to bar any surviving evidence, even old police reports, can be so significant in a cold case. If the FBI reports were to somehow enter the case, there are two timelines to consider, not just one. And that really is the central dispute in this cold case. Was Maria snatched at 7 p.m., or did the crime take place earlier before 6.20? Newspaper articles from the time and the FBI reports themselves show that establishing a clear timeline was a problem from the very first hours of this case. Only two facts relating to the timeline cannot be disputed. A collect call was placed from Rockford, 40 miles away, to the Tessier family's house at 6.57 p.m., and Maria wasn't reported missing to police until 8.10 p.m. So what happened at the corner of Center Cross Street and Archie Place between 6 and 8 p.m. on December 3, 1957? The police and FBI reports from 1957 could have helped shed light. CNN was able to examine about 200 pages of those reports. Thousands of pages more remain sealed from public view. If Maria was snatched at about 7 p.m., the defense says, John Tessier couldn't have been the kidnapper. He was 40 miles away in Rockford calling home from a payphone. That was the conclusion the FBI agents in Sycamore reached in 1957 when they cleared Tessier. A judge or jury might have reached the same conclusion. Defense attorney McCulloch believes, had the old FBI reports been admitted at the trial, the FBI verified all of, and the FBI reports themselves, show that establishing a clear timeline was of that information, he said. So if you are 40 miles away at that point, roughly three minutes, give or take, away from the time of the snatch, that is what we believe to be the perfect alibi. Appeals courts are unpredictable, lawyers say, and might sidestep the tricky hearsay questions if one or more other issues appear problematic. Other vulnerable areas, according to former Judge Stephen White, include the credibility of the jailhouse informants and the reliability of the eyewitness identification. These two issues have caused many a conviction to fall. Prosecutors are not permitted to offer inmates favors in exchange for testimony. But in this case, one inmate mentioned his assistance in the McCulloch case in court papers, seeking a reduction in his sentence and another did receive what the defense contends was favorable treatment. He was allowed to testify anonymously as John Doe. His name, his record, and other details about his background remain sealed from the public record. Campbell said he found the jailhouse informants credible because they told three different stories about how Maria died. Police couldn't have planted the stories the inmates told. 
What you get from this is there was no effort by us to go over there and hang out some cheese, and so whoever gives us the story gets the cheese, he said. Faulty eyewitness identification is also problematic. The defense contends that Kathy Chapman chose McCullough's photo from an impermissibly suggestive lineup. His was the only photo with a dark background. He was the only one not wearing a suit. The others looked off to the right, but he stared directly into the camera. The other's hair was combed while his was unruly. The other photos were yearbook photos. His was not. The defense also notes that investigator Hanley spoke with Chapman for about 90 minutes before returning more than a week later to show her the photos. Unlike Illinois, many states do not allow the same investigator who questions witnesses to show them photographs of suspects. The point is to avoid the natural tendency of witnesses to give the answers they think police want to hear. Campbell is certain that Jack McCullough killed Maria Ridolph. He is confident in Kathy's Chapman's identification of Johnny. He and Hanley note that she didn't learn she'd chosen McCulloch's photo until ten months later when he was charged. Campbell believes her when she says she could never forget his face, however problematic they might be. The testimony from the jailhouse informants and Kathy Chapman's eyewitness identification convinced Judge Halleck that McCullough was a child murderer and a kidnapper. He expressed confidence that his decision will be upheld on appeal. Defense attorney McCulloch and his investigator Harrell remain convinced that their client is innocent. If Campbell pursued the 55-year-old cold case as a means to re-election, it certainly backfired. The prosecutor lost his job by 700 votes just weeks after the conviction. Jack McCullough finally got his say at his sentencing. He stood before the court last December 10th, 55 years and seven days after Maria Ridolph disappeared. He used the occasion to tell his version of the truth. He insisted that he didn't kill Maria and that the FBI had cleared him. He blamed his legal predicament on ambitious cops, corrupt prosecutors, an incompetent judge and spiteful siblings. He challenged Kathy Chapman's ability to remember a face after 55 years. He accused the judge of ignoring the FBI reports and his alibi. Look inside the box, he exhorted, pointing to a carton labeled McCulloch case resting on the defense table. The truth is in the box. He was defiant to the end. His remarks to his probation officer were read aloud at his sentencing. Asked what caused him stress, he had said, corruption, Democrats, socialism, rude people, noisy people, black people, and Muslims. Maria's siblings did not stand up in court and speak. They chose instead to write letters which were slipped into the court file. The sad, simple beauty of their words bore stark contrast to the ugliness of McCullough's Chuck Ridolph wrote about the crime that defined his life and the little sister he never got to know. As his parents neared the end of their lives, he said, they both couldn't wait to be with Maria. They are buried next to her at Elmwood Cemetery. He wonders often about the woman Maria would have become. Would she have excelled at music? he asked. How would I have scrutinized her first boyfriend? Where would she have gone to college? Who would she have married? How many children would she have had? What fun would we have had together? The answer to all those questions and so many more, Jack McCullough snatched away. Snow began to fall as the hearing ended, and the key players in this cold case gathered one last time on the front steps of the old courthouse in Sycamore. The meaning was lost on no one, it had been snowing all those years ago when Maria was taken. Chuck Riddle felt the hand of God. Kathy Chapman saw her lost friend signaling approval. Once again, Kathy's hands felt cold. Some things never change. She had left her gloves behind in the car. She stopped by Maria's grave on her way home from court. 
She bent down and picked up a small rock with the word justice carved into it. She cradled it in her gloved hands as she bowed her head in silence. Asked later what she told Maria, she replied softly, private little things. After Kathy had gone, seven pennies, one for each year of Maria's life, were lined up on the headstone.